This is Something for the Pain, a podcast produced by Project Echo Idaho, made for Idaho's healthcare professionals working to prevent, treat, and facilitate recovery from opioid and substance use disorders throughout the GEM state. I'm your host, Sam Steffen. Well, the E stands for extensions, looking where we aim to be. CH is for community healthcare, the welfare you and me. Today we're continuing our theme of surveying substance use disorders and are going to be talking about benzodiazepines. This episode features a presentation by Nari Su, psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist at the Boise VA Medical Center, titled Tapering Off Benzodiazepines, The How and Why. While Dr. Su is employed by the Boise VA Medical Center, she would like listeners to know that her opinions are expressly her own and do not represent those of the Boise VA Medical Center. This lecture was recorded on November 11th, 2021, as a part of Echo Idaho's Opioids, Pain, and Substance Use Disorders series. Here to introduce today's presenter is former Echo Idaho director, Lachelle Smith. Welcome to Echo Idaho Opioids, Pain, and Substance Use Disorders. My name is Lachelle Smith. We'll facilitate the conversation today. So today, our talk is brought to us by Dr. Nari Su, a psychiatrist and addiction medicine fellow on tapering off benzos, the how and why. So um, we will give the floor to Dr. Su. All right, great, thank you. So I'm Nari Su, I'm a psychiatrist and addiction medicine fellow at the UW here in Boise. And today we are talking about tapering off of benzodiazepines, focusing on the how and the why. So learning objectives. So we're going to review the scope of the problem, identify the risk of benzodiazepine use, review some of the indications for tapering folks off of benzodiazepines, discuss ways to begin the conversation of benzodiazepine taper, which I think is pretty relevant clinically for a lot of us and the most challenging aspects in a lot of ways for benzo tapers, and then discuss kind of the pharmacological techniques for tapering people off of benzodiazepines. So here's a little bit of a timeline for benzodiazepine prescribing. So in 1960, chlorodiazepoxide, also known as Livram, entered the markets. And benzodiazepines kind of as a class became commonly referred to as a minor tranquilizer. They were considered at the time, kind of compared to other medications being used, to have less serious side effects, less toxicity, less potential for abuse, and less potential for physical dependence um, and even suicide risk. So they were kind of deemed safe at that time. As we kind of continued to prescribe them into the 1970s, we saw that these were really heavily prescribed. They were considered the most prescribed medication in the world by the time we hit the 70s. And then in 1975, the FDA said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, wait a minute. We're starting to notice some prevalence of abuse with this medication, misuse, and some serious side effects going with the medication and kind of the pattern of prescribing that was happening. And then by 2016, the FDA placed black box warnings on benzodiazepines that they are not prescribed to patients also using opioids due to the very high risk of overdose death, respiratory depression, and other serious interactions. So really over the course of like 40, 50 years, we see kind of these medications hit the market, really be effective, and then people start putting the brakes on them because we've been kind of over-prescribing and maybe getting people into some stickier situations than we had intended to in the 60s. So here are some of the trends and some of the language that we use for benzodiazepines. Um, Long-term use is defined as more than two to four weeks but people often are prescribed these medications for months or years even, or even decades. Prescription use from 1996 to 2013 has increased from 4.1% to 5.6%. We see that ambulatory visits for benzodiazepine prescribing have increased from 27.6 million in 2003 to 62.6 million in 2015. 
we're also seeing this increased rate of overdose deaths from 1996 to 2010, where there's the 0.58 per 100,000 adults, which is now 3.07 in 100,000 adults. So we're definitely seeing higher overdose deaths associated with benzodiazepine use. And then in 2017, 11,500 of those overdose deaths involved benzodiazepines, and 85% of those also included opioid. So this talk is not going to focus on opioid deprescribing. Certainly that is an area of concern. But when we look at benzodiazepines, we certainly see that we're putting folks at increased risk for overdose potential and death, especially with concurrent opioid use. So one of my areas of focus is in addiction medicine. So I want to kind of address how benzodiazepines can be correlated with addictive behaviors. You know, 58 to 100 percent of people prescribed chronic benzodiazepines become physically dependent. So that's one reason to be very cautious because of that kind of physiological change that happens. And then five to 10 percent of those folks will develop a substance use disorder. So they'll meet DSM-5 criteria. And then 50 percent of patients with a substance use disorder history will develop a benzodiazepine use disorder. So this gets a little bit risky when we're talking about using this medication for people who are even naive to stimulants or anxiolytics and people who have a history of substance use. Benzodiazepines are themselves not often the primary substance that's being abused. Oftentimes alcohol is involved, opioids, like we had said before, and stimulants can be comorbid. So we always want to screen for any other use disorder, especially with those other high-risk ones. And then physical dependence can develop within weeks of starting. Now, certainly this depends on the patient, kind of how much they're taking, how long they've been taking it for. Uh, but if someone is taking the benzodiazepine chronically daily for a significant length of time, they really can develop that addictive and physical dependent aspect to the medication. This is from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, kind of detailing how we've had slowly kind of increased the number of deaths involving benzodiazepines since 2001 and then taking this up to 2014. There is more evidence, like we've talked about, with having high rates of benzodiazepine overdose deaths in 2017. So this scale is kind of slowly just climbing, unfortunately. So we have to get this onto our radar, like, okay, something is not working in terms of how we're prescribing and how these medications are being used concurrently with other very dangerous medications and or alcohol. So let's address some of the risks of benzodiazepines. So I'm sure folks know quite a few of them. This is from VA Academic Detailing. And really, this is stuff I caution my patients about, you know, the big ones when you're using a benzodiazepine, just having that sensation of feeling very tired, very drowsy, sedated having trouble with thinking, kind of cognitive processing, it gets slowed, it's, you get forgetful. And then certainly we see a lot of mood change related to benzodiazepine use. So kind of worsening of anxiety, worsening of depression, irritability, anger outbursts, those are all fairly well associated. And then we know now there's a lot more evidence coming out that benzodiazepines exacerbate PTSD symptoms. So those really classical symptoms of nightmares and hypervigilance, hyperarousal, inability to process those past events. Benzodiazepines actually become a barrier to treatment. And so we always caution our folks that are, you know, have a diagnosis of PTSD that if they're on a benzodiazepine, this is making their PTSD symptoms worse and preventing them from recovering adequately. And then certainly there's the aspect of becoming physically dependent and having withdrawal symptoms, COPD, and sleep apnea, risk for pneumonia, car accidents, unsteady walking, increased risk of falls. I always tell my patients who are older than 65 that their risk for falls is a lot higher with benzodiazepine. And, you know, just one of those things that we kind of caution folks about for keeping them off the medication or at least reducing or tapering off the medication. And then certainly overdose risk like we've talked about, and then risk for birth defects or infants needing emergency care because of withdrawal symptoms. So, you know, when we're talking about benzodiazepine, we're really working with patients to kind of establish a risk versus benefits analysis. 
you know, this is already kind of primed to say, obviously the risks outweigh the benefits. And while certainly there are areas where the benefits can really kind of more or less outweigh the risks, those could be few and far between. And it's for a very kind of select population in my mind for folks who would be appropriate for kind of long-term use of benzodiazepines. We often talk about the benefits of benzodiazepines being that like short-term acute relief from symptoms. And benzodiazepines are really effective. Otherwise, they wouldn't really be around and kind of prescribed so often in our patient populations. But certainly, you know, long-term use, we see all of these other features that get us worried as clinicians. And so we're kind of being really mindful of educating and um, kind of providing that perspective for our patients. So I'm going to state this again because I think it's really important to hear, but overdose deaths to a high prevalence of opioids and benzodiazepine prescribing with 30% of all opioid overdose deaths in 2010 involving a benzodiazepine. And then 77% of benzodiazepine overdose deaths involving opioids. So they go hand in hand. So why would anyone use a benzodiazepine if there's, you know, so many risks involved? Um, this came out of the National Institute of Drug Abuse that 46% of folks do use a benzodiazepine to relax or relieve tension. Fair amount of them, 22%, use it to help with sleep. And then a fair portion of them also use it to help with emotions, which is a very broad category in my mind. So I, I think that this is um, referring more to anxiety, depression, panic disorders, panic states to get high. And then there's a small portion of people that do it to experiment and small slices of people who just kind of do it to increase or decrease the effect of other drugs. So we often see folks who are maybe on stimulants that are you know, having insomnia or feeling too anxious on the stimulant and to kind of counteract that, they take a benzodiazepine, so they kind of level off. This is from an article by Robert DuPont called Just Say No to Benzodiazepine Prescribing in Substance Use Individuals, where I kind of pulled some quotes that I thought were relevant. So benzodiazepine use for individuals in recovery is playing Russian roulette. Some survive the gamble, at least for a while, and many do not. And I think this really kind of infers the idea that folks with substance use disorders are at high risk for getting themselves into a spiral of using another medication, either benzodiazepine or something else, to kind of become physiologically dependent on and then addicted to. And then I like this piece too, anxiety is not a benzodiazepine deficient disease. You know, humans are not kind of born without benzodiazepines in their system and like need it like a vitamin or a supplement. And in some ways it may feel like we are a benzodiazepine deficient society, but physiologically we're not born benzodiazepine deficient. This is not a normal supplement that we need to have in our diets necessarily to kind of treat anxiety. And I think this kind of points out that there are other ways that we should be identifying to treat anxiety, insomnia, and other disorders that may be kind of masked by a benzodiazepine. So why would we taper anyone off of a benzo? Well, because it's high risk for overdose, high risk for misuse, high risk for abuse potential, and it's not recommended for people who have comorbid diseases. And we generally want to be cautious in the elderly. We want to be cautious in people who are on current chronic opioids. And the risks really generally outweigh the benefits for long-term use. We're seeing that more and more, and the evidence is bearing that out. It's an important reminder that long-term taper may be appropriate in all patients on long-term therapy. And just to be really mindful that, you know, once people have been on a benzodiazepine for decades, it's kind of expected because of the physiological changes involved that it's going to take a long time to get them off the medication. So in my line of work, I have hard conversations with people a lot of the time. One of the ways I think we can be successful doing this is by kind of doing all the things like meeting people where they are, 
building rapport, kind of setting expectations, and then really getting to the root cause for what people are concerned about in terms of getting off of a benzodiazepine. And that can apply to any medication that you're concerned about for people taking or in, you know, kind of thinking like this is dangerous and probably we should be decreasing this medication and getting you off of it. So building rapport for some people, it's easier said than done, but it's really important to kind of have that relationship with your patient kind of have that trust instilled into the room before you start kind of saying, you know, I'm going to take away this medication from you because I think it's not indicated. So having that trust set up and then, you know, setting expectations early on with patients. So when you're first meeting someone and they are already being prescribed a benzodiazepine, letting them know like, hi, like I don't prescribe Xanax, for example, you know, I, I'm more than happy to help you to stop taking this medication or figure out other ways that we can kind of manage your anxiety or whatever symptom that it is that we are treating. And then kind of putting the plug into like, you know, we, me, you, the team of us, we're going to put together a plan to get you off this medication that's safe and also treating the underlying condition. And certainly you want to provide education about anxiety disorders because these are the most common reasons why people are prescribed benzodiazepines. And you want to provide information about benzodiazepine use in terms of treating anxiety disorders and how in the short term you get relief from the anxiety when you get a benzodiazepine in your system. But unfortunately, as the anxiety gets worse and you use the benzodiazepine more, you become reliant on it. And then your risk for all the other things we've talked about increases and the system of avoidance becomes perpetuated and we end up getting into a bigger problem that we're, we're trying to get out of. Certainly I talk to my folks who are over 65 about kind of the loss of autonomy that's put at risk. So if you fall when you're elderly, that sets you up for a plethora of medical problems. And if we're putting you at increased risk for falling, we're also putting at increased risk for losing your autonomy at an earlier age than maybe you had planned. And so kind of setting that frame in people's mind, like, you know, this is a medication that's actually going to kind of worsen the aging process in some ways for you. Like it's going to just make it harder for you to deal with some of the changes going on for the changes with your cognition, changes with your memory, risk for falls, and really puts you at risk for being more dependent on others sooner than you have planned. What I like to tell people when we're discussing getting them off of benzodiazepines is focusing more on the behavior than on the guilt aspect of, you know, you're just using these to get out of the situation. So I usually say things along the lines of, you know, what your benzodiazepine use is telling me is that your anxiety is not getting better and we're not treating it right. And we need to find an alternative way to manage your anxiety, if that's the situation, in order to reduce your risk for falls, cognitive impairments, and dependence on this medication. So this is like kind of my general spiel. And the reason I use this is because I think it kind of puts the onus on the team. You know, you want to be collaborative. You want to understand where they're coming from and really identify what's going on that can be helpful to get them off the medication and identify other ways to treat their anxiety. This is all easier said than done. So this is from VA Academic Detailing. It's kind of a step-by-step outline for ways to kind of approach the conversation. You know, I like this because it's kind of a, a nice little script that you can use. So kind of expressing concern, providing that education on the potential risks and assessing where they are in terms of readiness to begin the tapering process and then kind of negotiating that plan. So once you have agreed with the patient on tapering up a benzodiazepine, you want to agree on the timing and discuss some of the symptoms that you anticipate patients having when they're on the taper and really letting them know that those symptoms are temporary. They're going to last for a few days, maybe up to a week, depending on how long they've been on it, how long your taper protocol is, but just to really set that expectation. So that way they're not thinking, you know, I have to go back to using my medication right away because now I'm just feeling much, much worse off medication and this is not working for me. Generally, you want to have a slow taper to decrease those withdrawal symptoms. 
And if they start having distressing symptoms, you can adjust the taper, you know, it, you can collaborate with the patient. It doesn't have to be completely formulaic following one outline that would work for someone else. It should be individually tailored. So some of the things you want to let your patients know about is that some of the withdrawal symptoms in the first one to four days are really going to be that rebound anxiety and insomnia. Those are going to be the most prevalent. So just kind of setting expectations. You know, I often tell people start tapering on the weekends. So you're not going to work having the rebound anxiety and insomnia because you can at least rest on the weekends. And then for the following 10 to 14 days, kind of let them know about some of the more full-blown withdrawal symptoms where they have really severe sleep disturbance, irritability, panic attacks, tremor, and then, you know, worsening of anxiety and insomnia. And that might be an indication that you have to slow the taper down. And then more than 14 days or two weeks later, you might actually see an unmasking or return of the baseline anxiety symptoms. And this can actually be really important diagnostically because then you can treat them with a medication that's more appropriate for long-term use. Always provide reassurance that their symptoms will resolve because this is kind of going to be a little bit uncomfortable for the beginning. And then, you know, hopefully we'll kind of taper off and get better as you go through the taper. Certainly, you want to consider a higher level of care if you're not able to manage them as an outpatient. So you could consider a psychiatric hospitalization if it's someone with concurrent alcohol use or other psychiatric disorders that you're worried about them kind of decompensating. You know, you kind of want to have that discussion with the patient, and that's really on an individual basis. And then a nice principle to go by is to use a benzodiazepine with a long half-life to prevent some of those rebound anxiety symptoms, the insomnia, and those discontinuation symptoms. So benzodiazepine tapering can be uncomfortable, and unfortunately, there's very limited evidence for adjunctive agents. Like I said earlier, if they're having those symptoms, you can just slow down on the taper. You know, gradual taper is preferred because you don't want them to think that they need to go back on to the benzodiazepine because that's the opposite direction of where you're trying to go. There are some medications that have been helpful in kind of managing the symptoms. So carbamazepine may be helpful. There's limited evidence, but this is a medication you do have to be very careful with genetic testing for certain populations. So you have to get HLA-B. 1502 testing for, so you don't precipitate Stevens-Johnson syndrome. For listeners who may not be familiar with this disease, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is a rare serious disorder of the skin and mucous membranes, usually caused by a reaction to medication that begins with flu-like symptoms, followed by a painful rash that spreads and blisters. Gabapentin and pregabalin can be helpful, kind of as adjunctive medications for the anxiety and the insomnia melatonin for insomnia, for sleep, trazodone also for the insomnia, and then hydroxyzine kind of as a PRN medication to help with the anxiety. So, you know, it's very patient dependent. Certainly, we want to try to maximize some of the non-pharmacological options for addressing the symptoms related to benzo withdrawal. So if folks are experiencing insomnia, nightmares, sleep disturbances, Always review sleep hygiene. You know, it's, it seems really basic, but you want to kind of go back to the basics with this. So avoiding stimulants before bedtime, avoiding TV, blue light, phones, you know, reserving the bed for sleep and sex, getting out of the bed after 30 minutes if you're still awake, making sure that people are kind of calming down into the evening instead of like ramping themselves up. You want to make sure, too, that when you are tapering, that you're scheduling most of the benzos at night during the period. So that way you kind of get more bang for your buck. Certainly, if you need to and people need to have coverage in the daytime, you can do that. But it's kind of nice to increase the dose or have higher doses at nighttime than in the morning. So that way you're really maximizing that sleep impact. And then certainly with anxiety symptoms and panic attacks, having some psychological techniques, getting folks involved in individual or group behavior therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy can be really helpful. Having people do physical activity, aerobics, walking, swimming, yoga, meditation, acupuncture, those are all great techniques to getting people to kind of learn how to address the anxiety in a different way. So... Going back to kind of that 14-day period off of benzodiazepines or when you're tapering and you start to unmask some symptoms of anxiety and some symptoms of insomnia, 
certainly for anxiety, if you're feeling like, you know, this person meets criteria for something like a panic disorder or generalized anxiety, you want to start looking at medications like SSRIs, SNRIs, Buspirone is great for generalized anxiety disorder, hydroxyzine, pregabalin, and then also kind of doing the two hit punch, medications and therapy, getting people involved with cognitive behavioral therapy or exposure therapy to really kind of treat that underlying anxiety disorder, because these are going to be more of the long-term solutions rather than kind of that short burst of treatment that the benzodiazepine offers. And then for insomnia, you know, you want to make sure that you're not missing kind of a sleep disorder. So if someone has primary insomnia, which is fairly atypical, you can use CBTI, their CBTI coach, which is an app that came out from the VA that just has like journaling and a lot of psychoeducation about insomnia. And then you can get folks involved in brief behavioral therapy. And then certainly there's medications that can help with that too. So doxepin, which is a TCA and then non-benzodiazepine medications like sulfidem as options. So when you are tapering, this is kind of the nitty gritty portion of it. There's a couple of different ways that you can approach it. So there's short tapers, you know, over the course of four to six weeks, or there's long tapers over the course of several months to years, really depending on the patient. So if you're going to do a shorter taper, you just want to kind of decrease the dose by 50% over the first month and then kind of hold for a little bit at 50% of that dose for a while, and then start to kind of chip away every two weeks by 25%. You know, you want to make sure though, when you're doing these tapers, that you're always using the original dose amounts as your starting point, and you're not using the dose that they're going from after that and calculating from there, because then that gets really messy. Longer tapers, there's a lot of practice variation. You can do 10 to 25% dose reduction over the course of like two to four weeks. I prefer this, you know, typically I'll convert people over to clonazepam because it's longer acting and there's less withdrawal symptoms or discontinuation symptoms. And we'll just do like a very, very slow taper. So it's comfortable. So people aren't feeling like they need to have more of the medication. So we're kind of, we're not hopefully dropping the ball on them. Some kind of general tips, you can begin the taper with a benzodiazepine that is being prescribed. If they're not able to tolerate the taper with a short acting benzodiazepine like Xanax, you can certainly switch to a longer acting option. This here is nice. You can diazepam for younger adults and then lorazepam for adults age 65 and over. A slower or longer taper schedule is recommended in most cases. So really kind of emphasizing that. And the rate of benzo taper should ultimately be determined by the patient's symptoms. So really checking in with patients, making sure that they have a way to access you and kind of know what to go back to if they're not feeling like that medication or that dose adjustment is working out for them. An alternative way that I like to do for tapering people off their medications is reduce the actual total number of tablets that a person will have for a month. So if they get 30 tablets of 0.5 eclonopin in a 30-day period, you can just decrease it to like 20 tablets and say, okay, you've got these 20 tablets, you know, over the course of the next month, what you can do is just on the days that you feel like you want to do this, you can take the medication, but you're not going to get a refill until 30 days after. And even then we're going to start decreasing it from there. I like this method because it really puts the onus on the patient to decide when they're going to take the medication for them to be responsible for when they're going to take it. And then know, you know, that they only have X amount of the medication remaining. So it's kind of for a specific patient uh, that you feel like has that kind of buy-in and really wants to manage their medications on their own and that you have a good rapport with. But I think it can be really helpful to kind of build that kind of collaborative, like I'm providing this medication for you, but you're the patient and you're in charge of your body and I'm letting you be autonomous. So some key points, if you don't start a benzodiazepine, you don't have to taper a benzodiazepine. Make sure that if you are starting a benzodiazepine, that you have an exit plan, you know, always educate your patients that you're going to do short-term benzodiazepine treatment, you know, four to six weeks. And then we're going to stop after that. If we need to, we can taper and it'll be a very short taper. And then just have that kind of clearly defined and discussed with the patient. You know, really important to know that abrupt discontinuation of benzodiazepines can be dangerous and extremely uncomfortable. Gradual taper is preferred over augmenting withdrawal symptoms with other medications because then you're kind of running the risk of polypharmacy. 
And then really essential to set clear and consistent boundaries, expectations, and instructions regarding benzodiazepine tapers. Questions do folks have about benzo tapering generally or anywhere else you want to take it? I'm, I'm curious as to whether. Speaking here is Dr. Neil Reagan, family medicine physician at HealthWest in Pocatello and a regular Echo Idaho participant. Any of the providers in today's crowd have had the experience where someone has come back to them and said, Doctor, uh, I am so grateful that you took me off my benzo. <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting for that patient personally. And has that, does that ever happen? I did just recently. Speaking here is Jessica Bringman, a nurse practitioner in Idaho and an Echo Idaho participant. I had a 60 some year old female that presented and she had been on clonazepam for several years. And she was also on three antidepressants. And I talked to her about the risks of long-term benzodiazepine use. And she was like, take me off of these now. And so we started a slow taper. I didn't make it fast. And she ended up tapering herself faster than I had originally wanted to taper her and she's been off of it. She's had no requests to go back on it. And she's had some significant anxiety provoking things that have gone on since she's been off of it, but she's still happy that she is not on it. And she told me, she said, I did not understand how much of a fog I was in. So she, she's thankful that she's not taking it anymore. I also have, but it's been very, very few. This is Julie Wood speaking here, an Idaho physician, also an Echo Idaho participant. I would say my experience was very similar in that you just, you build that rapport, you work with them, you let them know you're there and that you're going to do this slowly. And I, again, have had a couple of people that say they actually feel better. They don't feel as tired. They don't feel as foggy. But I've also on the flip side had many people file formal grievances because of my practices. So it, it's hit or miss. Well, for, for me, getting the buy-in is the hard part. I, I always feel like I'm dragging this patient to a place that they don't want to go and they're resisting all the way. And, and, and these are not contentious relationships. I mean, these I, I feel like I have good relationships with these patients, but I, I always feel like I'm the one that, that's pushing them and they're, they're resisting. And of course, every other medication that you throw at them, they've tried and it doesn't work and so on and so forth. And and then they come back with, well, this is the only thing that allows me to function. You know, I'm able to work. I'm able to do the things that I need to do to get through life. Why are you taking this away from me when nothing else works? And so I struggle with that piece of it. Jake, what would you say to that? I think that is the more common thing to happen. Speaking here is Dr. Jake Harris, psychiatry and addiction medicine specialist at the Boise VA Medical Center and panelist for Echo Idaho's Opioids, Pain, and Substance Use Disorders series. Several years ago, the VA did a outreach where they sent people letters who were on benzodiazepines who were either on opioids in conjunction with that or were over 65. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. None of my patients are going to respond because if they're still on a benzo, I've already had this discussion. Lo and behold, like a week after the mail out goes out, I see a patient and he's like, I can't believe that you didn't tell me about all these things with this benzo. I want to get off of this. And so it's a good reminder that I probably didn't have the discussion overtly enough and often enough with this person and had kind of given up and said, here's your benzo. In this case, you don't have anything else going on. We'll just keep it going. And then he was able to taper off and actually did pretty well. But I think that the vast majority of people are more in the category of even if they agree to it, they will get to the point where they say, yeah, I still wish I could be on that benzodiazepine. It it tends to work better. And I think that really speaks to the power of a benzodiazepine. It is an incredibly effective medication. And once someone's had that as the medication, other things to to target anxiety don't work as well. 
And I think that's the biggest risk in starting it because it's not going to happen to every single person that they become addicted, that they start having behavioral issues related to it. But what will happen is that it's a lot harder for anyone who's been on a benzo to go to anything else to target their anxiety. I think that is also one of the very common things that we see is that someone will come in and say, this is the only thing that works. And here's how terrible I'm doing in my life. So both at the same time, I got to be on this and my life is terrible. So they're either saying I need more or they're saying I need to do something more. And I really like to point that out to them that, yes, you are on this medication and yes, it's working. And I'm not going to argue that this medication doesn't work for you. What I am going to point out is that you're not in a great place. And I think we can get you to a better place in the long term that will either include less benzodiazepine or maybe not any benzodiazepine at all. And it will take time and it will take effort and it will be a little bit rocky, but we can get you to a better place than you're currently at. And that's usually where I get the most buy-in for people is when they can kind of recognize, oh yeah, I'm not like where I want to be anyway. So it's not like I'm going from perfect to going off the med and being horrible. I'm going from already in in distress all the time and maybe I can get better. I think sometimes kind of coming at it as a harm reduction approach too is okay. Maybe we can't get you off completely, but if we can decrease how much you're using and look at the the potential benefits around that, that can sometimes be helpful for patients as well. Or I've found that in the past. And I completely agree on that. I have, I've had patients that have panic disorder that when they came to me, they were on high dose of alprazolam and that's it. And the one I'm thinking of is still on alprazolam. We've gotten him down to about 50% of what he was on, but we started an SSRI and slowly titrated it. So over time, I still have this patient on a dose of Xanax or alprazolam that I'd like to get lower, but he's on a significantly lower dose than he was several years ago, and he's doing better. There's a question in the chat that I I think we could address. Echo Idaho sessions typically feature multiple participants joining live via Zoom. One of the benefits of attending live is that participants can easily ask their questions in Zoom's chat feature to receive answers from Echo panelists and presenters, just like Dr. Harris is addressing here. How strong is the recommendation to taper non-benzo receptor agonist beds like Zolpidem? So the hypnotics, the Z drugs that include Zolpidem and Zalaplon, they hit a different area of the brain. They're not as generalized as the GABA agonists like the benzodiazepines. And the biggest issue with them is that they've never really been tested long term. And so people do become pretty tolerant to them quite quickly. And I think that's the biggest thing that we know is that the tolerance to it. We also know that the hypnotics are associated with amnestic events. So if someone takes it and then they don't go to sleep, then they do things and they don't lay down that memory of, of it happening. Um, and that's one of the risks. And then, you know, the, the risks in PTSD, the risks in trauma, the risks combined with opioids, they're there, but they're not as strong as with the regular benzodiazepines. I kind of lump them together with a, an asterisk. You know, if we're really addressing insomnia, I, would, I will try to get something else that's going to be more helpful than those medications. And I'll try to use them only short term, but mostly because they just lose their efficacy over the long term. When are you reaching for benzos or are you short course, long course, breakthrough anxiety? There are definitely times where where benzos can be appropriate. Psychotic patients, absolutely. Short term, someone died in the family and and someone's not sleeping. That's a great time for a hypnotic like Zolpidem to be used. A stressor in life that comes up that causes someone to be really panicky that is expected to be short term. That's when it's good to use a benzo. When it's not great to use the benzos, when they come in, they say, my sleep has been terrible for 20 years and my anxiety has been terrible for 20 years. You're not going to start a benzo and get them off of a benzo. It's going to work so well that they'll be like, this works. And then you'll run out of options down the road. So those are the patients that I would be more cautious in. So when you start an SSRI, you start low and go slow in anxiety because you can have a temporary increase in anxiety and restlessness. And those are the cases where you can use a benzodiazepine 
for a short term period. If you do that, I, I strongly recommend making sure the patient knows that it is a short term prescription only to target anxiety right now while we get this medication going. And within two to six weeks, we are going to stop this medication and not continue it. That's the discussion that I have with patients when I start it in those cases. Thank you. Nari, do you have anything you want to add? No, I totally agree with that. Dr. Harris nailed it. That again was Nari Sue, psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist at the VA Medical Center in Boise, presenting Tapering Off Benzodiazepines, the How and Why. That lecture was recorded live on November 11th, 2021, as part of Echo Idaho's Opioids, Pain, and Substance Use Disorders series. If you'd like to watch the Zoom recording of that presentation, that video is currently available on the Echo Idaho YouTube channel, which you can access through our website. The PowerPoint slide deck, as well as information about how to contact some of the organizations and services mentioned in that talk, are available in our podcast show notes on our podcast webpage, www.uidaho.edu slash echo hyphen podcast. If you're interested in joining our free live echo sessions to receive continuing education credit, learn best practices, ask a question, or grow your community, please visit our website at www.uidaho.edu echo, where you can register to attend, sign up to receive announcements, donate, and find out more information about our programs. Season 3 of Something for the Pain is brought to you by Echo Idaho, supported by the Whammy Medical Education Program and the University of Idaho, and is made possible with funding provided by BJA, the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We here at Echo also want to hear your feedback. We welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions, and invite you to email us at echoidaho at uidaho.edu. And don't forget to subscribe to Something for the Pain using your podcast app. And if you have a moment, write us a review. Something for the Pain was supported by grant number 15PBJA21GG04557COAP, awarded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. The Bureau of Justice Assistance is a component of the Department of Justice's Office of Justice Programs, which also includes the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the National Institute of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office for Victims of Crime, and the SMART Office. Points of view or opinion in this recording are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. You can earn CE credit while you sit and eat your lunch. The contributing voices on today's episode were those of Nari Sue, Michelle Smith, Neil Reagan, Julie Wood, Jessica Bringman, and Jake Harris. We'd also like to thank all of our listeners, without whom none of this would be possible. Without you, we'd just be talking to ourselves. Well, you know what that spells. Echo.